time for the Longines Chronoscope, a television journal of the important issues of the hour, brought to you every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. A presentation of the Longines Whitnor Watch Company, maker of Longines, the world's most honored watch, and Whitnor, distinguished companion to the world-honored Longines. Good evening, this is Frank Knight. May I introduce our co-editors for this edition of the Longines Chronoscope. Mr. William Bradford Huey, author and analyst, and Mr. Hardy Burt, author and correspondent. Our distinguished guest for this evening is Dr. Howard Russ, chairman of the American Korean Rehabilitation Commission. <laughs> Dr. Russ, we're fortunate this evening in that you have just returned from Korea and you can give us a first-hand report on some of those, some of the interesting things there. First of all, our viewers are most interested about the prospects for peace in the Orient, sir. How do you feel yourself about the prospects for a peaceful settlement? Well, I'm, I'm not uh, an expert in that uh, line, but it certainly is very heartening to me. It seems to me that this is one step that we must make. And uh, in my own heart, I can't help but feel hopeful about it. Well, sir, you, of course, are a famous doctor and uh, one of the most famous people in the country regarding rehabilitation work because you visited so many nations for our own country. But first of all, sir, what can you tell our viewers about the medical <coughs> care of our own GIs in Korea? Well, I'm particularly interested in that because Having served in the Air Force in the last war and still being in the medical service, I had an opportunity to visit a number of our military hospitals in Korea. And never in the history of the world have soldiers gotten as good care, as prompt care, with as low mortality rates and uh, as little suffering. Have, have we improved over our medical techniques in the Second World War? Oh, very definitely. Uh, our record is very much better, and especially uh, the air evacuation with helicopter and uh, plane and hospital ships, and hospital trains and trained uh, mobile surgical units right behind the lines and then back to Tokyo where everything is available. The, the soldier who's hit on the front lines now in Korea has the best chance of surviving that he's ever had. That anybody's any ever had in any war. Doctor, since you just came back from Korea, there have been, you can give us a little report on this, perhaps. I know that you say you're not a military expert, but you must have observed something there. Uh, there have been quite a lot of reports about an ammunition shortage over there, which would be a very serious thing, of course. Did you see any signs of an ammunition shortage while you were in Korea? Well, I can only quote uh, General Maxwell Taylor on that particular point, and uh, at dinner some two weeks ago, he said this said, I have never known a commander who had enough ammunition. Ammunition is like money in the bank. You spend it when you need it. He said, I have all that I need to spend and plenty in reserve for any foreseeable contingency. Well, that's reassuring now. There's a second big issue in this country today so far as Korea is concerned. The uh, thought of the South Koreans backing up the American troops. What kind of soldiers do you think they'll make? Oh, observation. Uh, that I can speak very forcibly on. Uh, I don't think many people realize the tremendous tempo of training that's going on uh, in the ROC Army in Korea at the present time. We have 16 service schools in Korea. We have a little Fort Benning and a little Fort Knox and a medical service school. And uh, the tempo of training is tremendous. And these boys, when they go to the front now, you remember in the early days of the war, they were going up with only five days of training. And do the American troops themselves have confidence in the South Korean troops, the soldiers? Terrific. In many of the squads up front, there are two Korean boys in the American squads, and they're on the buddy system. Uh, and uh, I heard a number of officers told me that the Koreans were so accurate with their artillery that very often our troops asked that their artillery support come from their Korean comrades. Well, Doctor, of course, the purpose of your mission to Korea <coughs> was to uh, lay plans for the rehabilitation of the civilian population of Korea. Is that correct? That's sir? right. Our mission went over to see uh, what the needs were, and we knew before we went that they were great, but we had no idea until we saw how well, great. Can, can, you, 
Can, can you illustrate for our viewers, sir, can you tell us something about the extent of civilian suffering in Korea? Well, of course, you know, first, Korea has been fought over five times. 600,000 houses have been destroyed. There are 100,000 counted orphans. There are 7 million refugees. Speaking of those orphans, I've seen pictures in various magazines and in the press about these homeless waifs uh, by the roadside that the soldiers would pick up. Is there much, or are there many of these strays, stray children There's there? There's a good many, especially yeah. in the refugee centers like Busan. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a tremendous uh, health problem in Korea. In the first place, I'd like to say that I think they've done the greatest public health job under the greatest odds in modern history. Typhoid, malaria, typhus, smallpox are all under control. There's Tuberculosis been, is a great problem. There's been no great epidemics. No. Then. But 7.5% of the population have tuberculosis. That's a million 600,000 people. And 400,000 are acutely ill with tuberculosis and no hospital beds. There are only 850 trained Korean doctors in civilian life today for 19 million people. That's one for every 23,000. Is our military organization able to assist the civilian population any, medic, give them medical assistance? They've done a wonderful job. There, there isn't a, a clinic or, I mean, a clinic for Korean civilians that uh, our doctors don't go and work after hours. They come in our hospitals when beds are available. Now a training program has been set up for young uh, rock army surgeons. Uh, half the teaching in the medical schools are being done off hours by American doctors. I was in one briefing with a two-star general, and at 5 o'clock a major got up in the back and held up his hand. He said, may I be excused? And the general said, uh, uh, yes, what for? He said, I have to go and teach my class at the medical school. He said, you're excused. When he went out, he said, that man has taught a class every day from five to six, five days a week for over eight months and never missed a day. How about the individual GIs? Do they recognize the plight of the, of the South Koreans and try to help them out in, in, individu in an individual way, from person oh, to person? I, uh, that was one of the most mo moving things uh, that uh, you, you see in Korea. Uh, they feel toward them as their comrades in arms. They recognize their plight. There isn't an outfit over there that doesn't have an orphanage or a hospital or a group of orphans uh, or somebody. They're helping. One of the biggest uh, sales items in uh, the PX today are care packages of powdered milk and powdered eggs specially made up so the GIs can buy them and give them to the Koreans. Well, and this is sort of a new precedent, really, because uh, historically, armies have never gotten along with civilian populations, particularly foreign armies. Now, would you say these people are getting along well? The, the GIs are getting along very well with the South Korean people? Remarkably well, and I think I know why. Uh -huh. In many ways, they're, they're like us. They're rugged individualists. They're tall, strong people. Uh, someone has said that they're the Irish of the Orient. I told that to a Korean friend. He said, you're mistaken. He said, the Irish are the Koreans of Europe. <laughs> to me, they're sort of a mixture between the Irish and the Finns. They're rugged individualists and real tough fighters. But our boys respect them, and they respect uh, also their, their problems. Well, our people, perhaps seeing the Koreans in the newsreels, they don't seem to be suffering in the, in the way, manner that we've seen other people suffering. Uh, is there any explanation for that, sir? Well, one uh, physician said that you can't uh, diagnose malnutrition unless you strip the patient. And you see children in these refugee camps with their cute round faces. You don't recognize the fact that uh, under the rags they just have uh, wisp for legs and arms. Well, Doctor, you, of course, are, are making a report on your observations. Now, can you give us some indication of the recommendations you're going to make for relieving this suffering? Well, in the American Korean Foundation, and that's a hyphenated word, it's both Americans and Koreans, we hope to sort of be the yeast in the bread to be helpful in stimulating and working with some of the United Nations programs, the missionary programs, and they've done a terrific job in Korea, and the other relief programs. While we were there, we established a rehabilitation center for amputees, uh, working with... Uh, uh, You're supplying them artificial limbs, things of that sort. Our, uh, uh, our uh, foundation is going to supply them trained teachers. Uh, the Rock Army are going to furnish the prosthesis in the beginning. The Rock government, the Rice, and UNCRA, the, the teachers and the vocational schools, and all together with this team now, we, we're on the road.
What is the principal need for helping these people outside of the fact that it does come from the heart and we always want to help people that are suffering? Well, I think that uh, primarily the American people will want to help because I think that's the best way they can back up the GIs. One boy in the hospital told me, he said, I told my folks not to send me any more food packages. We have plenty of food here and I can get ice cream and anything I want. But send me things that I can help my Korean friends with. I think that's number one. And I think this has to be a warm per program, a person-to-person -person sort of thing. Because I think that's the way we feel. You see, America. you see American organizations adopting orphanages and that sort of thing over there. Well, I've talked at two or three meetings, my own staff at the hospital yesterday and in the little church I go to in Westchester the day before, and both of them want to take an orphanage. The hope of the future of Korea, and I think uh, in not an insignificant degree, the free world of the Korean children, the most wonderful, eager kids that I ever saw any place. And, and do you foresee, uh, for our viewers who may be interested in, in this program, sir, just, just how can they help the individual American? Well, I think uh, 10 cents a day will give uh, a Korean child an additional, an addition to his diet that makes it adequate. 40 cents will take care of an orphan and feed and clothe and educate him. $200 a year will put a Korean youngster through college. Uh, I mean, that's the sort of thing I, uh, that, that <coughs> when I talk about a warm program, and I think people will want to well, do. Well, I'm sure that our viewers appreciate these expressions from you, sir, and thank you for being with us. Thank you. The opinions that you've heard our speakers express tonight have been entirely their own. The editorial board for this edition of the Nongene Chronoscope was Mr. William Bradford Huey and Mr. Hardy Burt. Our distinguished guest was Dr. Howard Rusk, chairman of the American Korean Rehabilitation Commission. In England, as in America, Longines is famous as the world's most honored watch. And in commemoration of the coming coronation of the gracious Queen Elizabeth, Longines has produced several series of coronation watches, including these magnificent examples in the art of the jeweler watchmaker, each bordered with a continuous band of diamonds of the finest quality. In each one is the famed Longines watch movement, one of the very few watch mechanisms in the whole world worthy of a frame of diamonds. Among the finest watches in the world, only Longines has won 10 World's Fair grand prizes, <clears throat> 28 gold medals, and so many honors for accuracy in competitive accuracy trials at the great government observatories. Now, whether you pay 71.50 or many hundreds of dollars for a watch, every Longines watch is made to the single uncompromising Longines standard of perfection. So when next you buy a watch, either for yourself or as an important gift, these are facts to remember. Longines, the world's most honored watch, the world's most honored gift for mother on Mother's Day, for a wedding, an anniversary, or for a graduation. Longines, premier product of the Longines Whitnor Watch Company since 1866, maker of watches of the highest character. We invite you to join us every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday evening at this same time for the Longines Chronoscope, a television journal of the important issues of the hour, broadcast on behalf of Longines, the world's most honored watch, and Whitnor, distinguished companion to the world honored Longines. This is Frank Knight reminding you that Longines and Whitnor watches are sold and serviced from coast to coast by more than 4,000 leading jewelers who proudly display this emblem. Agency for Longine with Noah Watson. This is the CBS Television Network.